Welcome, everybody. Welcome, everyone, to a special meeting of the Cape Elizabeth Town Council. It is Wednesday, April 26th. Will the town clerk please call the roll? Chairman Backer. Present. Councilor Dill. Here. Councilor Fritz. Here. Councilor Lynch. Here. Councilor McKenney. Here. Councilor Moles. Here. Councilor Swift Payada. Here. Pledge of Allegiance. Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Well, once again, welcome everybody. We have two items on our agenda this evening. They are both public hearings. Um, the first is a public hearing on the proposed fiscal year 2007 general fund and special funds budgets. And the second is a public hearing on, the, on proposed adjustments um, in the sewer service charges. I will assume that most of you are here for the first item on the agenda. However, you are welcome to stay for the second item on the agenda. We will take a break after the first one so those of you who would like to leave can and won't feel that you are disrupting the meeting. But again, when the time comes, I will stress the invitation to stay and comment if you would like on the second item on our agenda. David, I was wondering since there maybe only a very few people or none on the second item if we might take that out of order and just get that over with and then move on to the first item well let me i, I suspect that there may be very few people it, for the second uh, item. um it, uh, let me ask um how many people are here by a show of hands uh, because of interest in or a desire to speak on the issue of the sewer service fee adjustment is there anyone? There's one? Was there one? I didn't see a hand. So there is no one here to speak with regard to sewer service fees. Okay. But thank you for the suggestion. Um, well, well taken. Well, with that said, um, by way of background, on April 13, um, just a little over a week ago at a special town council meeting, the town council received a report from the finance committee, which is the same group of seven people, but sitting as the finance committee. Town council received a report from the finance committee with a recommendation for the uh, fiscal year 2007 budget. The fiscal year 2007 begins on July 1, 2006, and runs through June 30, 2007. Um, based on that recommendation, the town council set for public hearing for tonight to receive public comment on the proposed budget, the entire budget, which includes the municipal, school, community services, and special funds budgets. No decision will be made by the council tonight on the budget. Budget adoption will take place here in the council chambers at our regular May council meeting, which will be held on May 15. The purpose of tonight's meeting is solely to receive public comment. People are welcome and encouraged to speak on any aspect of the entire budget, whether it be municipal, school, community services, or special funds. And we are pleased to see people engaged in the budget process. And we in Cape Elizabeth should be per particularly proud to see as many people as we have here tonight engaged in the process. I ask that those who do speak respect the town council limit of three minutes. And I also respectfully request that everyone who speaks, well, everyone who is here, honor the council rule that people in attendance not express approval 
or disapproval of statements made by a speaker. Applause or expression of approval or disapproval in any way is distracting. It's distracting to the speaker and it's certainly distracting to those of us who are trying to listen to the message that's, that's being given. Um, and I don't want to be inconsiderate of any speaker, but in fairness and to be considerate of all speakers, I will try to gently enforce the three minute rule. I mean, at three minutes a trap door will not open up beneath your feet, but I will gently and kindly ask you to try and wrap up if you're still speaking at three minutes. And I know how hard it is to judge time when you're speaking. Um, I know that better than anybody. Um, final note, um, we have received lots of comments over the last several weeks, and based on those comments, we know how strongly people feel across the board on the spectrum of views that have been presented to us on the budget. We merely ask that everyone be respectful and accord each speaker the deference that they would want and expect for themselves while addressing the council. And I think that perhaps the best way to do this, um, knowing that there will be a spectrum of views to be presented tonight, I don't want to rush for people to line up. Um, let's have five people at a time. We'll start with people who support the superintendent's proposed budget. And after five people have spoken who support the superintendent's proposed budget, um, we'll hear from up to five people who want to express a position of support for something less than the superintendent's proposed budget. Then we'll go back to five people who do support, and we'll do that until we don't have any more people to speak on one side or the other, and then everybody else who wants to speak can just line up and have at it. Um, now that's assuming that most of you are here to speak with regard to the school budget. Anybody who wants to comment with regard to the municipal side of the budget, special funds budgets, um, the community services budgets, I'd say step up to the plate anytime you're ready. But with that in mind, um, I do ask that whoever speaks, state your name, um, state your address, we want the minutes to reflect who has spoken. Uh, please spell your last name so our town clerk who is keeping our minutes uh, will get your name spelled correctly. Um, and I think with that said, we are ready to begin. I say one quick thing. Yes. Just uh, if I might, just we have a, a good sized crowd here this evening. I just wanted to remind everyone that there's an exit door on this side, there's an exit door in the back. And for those up on the ramp, that, that also does exit straight out uh, <coughs> the front. So it, particularly if, if there was a fire uh, or, uh, or the alarm went off, particularly if the folks on the balcony could exit that way, it would be helpful. And, and let me correct one, one statement that I made. I was referring to the superintendent's budget, and I shouldn't refer to the superintendent's budget in, reference, in, in deference to um, our superintendent, Alan Hawkins, and in deference to the school board. It is the, the school board's recommended budget, not the superintendent's budget. So um, when we talk about supporting the proposed school budget, it's, I shouldn't have referred to the superintendent's budget. We'll call it the school board's recommended budget. With that said, Judge Melanson. <coughs> Thank you, uh, uh, Councilor Backer. Um, good, good evening. My name is Jack Melanson, M E L. A-N-S-O-N. I live at uh, 3 Rockwall Lane in Cape Elizabeth with my wife and three children. Uh, I first have to preface my remarks that these remarks represent my opinion as a private citizen. Uh, I have no, and these remarks are made pursuant to the Hatch Act and uh, do not represent uh, necessarily the opinions of any other government entity. 
Well, I'll take back my reference to Judge Melanson Wall. <laughs> Mr. M Thank Mr. You. Melanson, it's, you at may... this point, it's just Jack. <laughs> Mr. Melanson, you may proceed. <laughs> um, several weeks ago, uh, Councilor Swift Cayetta, in a letter to the editor of a local newspaper, uh, rejected any increase in school funding above a 3.4% increase over the previous year's budget, citing her prior pledge not uh, to limit public spending. The counselor questioned what example she would set for students if she failed to fulfill her promise and concluded that a promise made should always be kept. Ultimately, however, this conclusion is an error. When the facts underlying a promise change or an unforeseen need arises, the dictates of law, equity, and fundamental fairness are not so inflexible that one is always bound to a promise, the keeping of which will result in greater harm than if the promise was not fulfilled. When in 2004 certain counselors uh, pledged to limit future spending to a 3.4 percent cap, they could not have accurately calculated the vagaries of time and circumstance that would compel a need for a school budget increase of 6.95 percent in this year's budget. By contrast, the Town Council now has before it the School Committee's proposed budget. This proposed budget is the product of thorough investigation, timely, re timely reflection, and vigorous debate. It is a balanced, reliable statement of the needs of public education in Cape Elizabeth. It is a budget which, if reduced, will result in irreparable harm to Cape Elizabeth students. Councillor Swift Cayetta and fellow councillors, the first lesson for Cape students in getting back to the question posed by Councillor Cayetta implicitly in her letter. The first letter for Cape students is that sometimes it is necessary. Mr. Melanson, I'm almost. If you can just start I'll to wrap, wrap up. Right up. Thank you. The first, the first lesson for Cape students is that sometimes it is necessary for decent, well intentioned, honorable public servants such as yourselves to break a pledge. The second lesson is that the keenness of intellect the strength of character, and the nobility of purpose that underlies such a decision are the elements of political courage and moral leadership. I ask you and urge you to adopt the proposed budget in total. Thank you. Good evening. Um, I think I'm exhibiting political courage to gain up speaking after that. Um, my name is Rebecca Millette. I live at 12 Wombeck Road. I'm also the finance chair for the school board. And I want to thank the town council for making this opportunity available to um, all of us. And I'm actually just going to um, limit my comments to addressing some issues and providing maybe some clarification to some information that um, has been discussed quite a bit in our community. Um, first, there is a perception held by some that our schools are experiencing declining enrollment. And I would just like to reiterate that since 1998-1990 school year, that's seven years, our schools have seen increasing enrollment each year. This is actual enrollment. It's clear from our past experiences forecasting future enrollment is much less certain and I'm encouraged that the Town Council and School Board are on the same page regarding the need for better projections. I'm not certain if we will ever be able to come up with perfect predictors, which is why there are usually margins of plus or minus 10 percent to remind us that they aren't exact. Now having said that, the School Board has calculated some new enrollment figures for next year, which we have shared with you today, and we apologize for the lateness of it. It's just been a real compressed time period through this whole process. Um, 
So these projections may better account for in and out migration, and it does show stable enrollment for next year instead of a decline as projected by the Planning Decisions 35 new home model. Secondly, I would like to reiterate that the cap budget increase that's allowed only covers roughly 86% of existing staff salaries and benefits. When you add to that a 45% increase in energy, a 143% increase in out-of-district tuition costs, a 52% increase in bus and transportation costs, then the cap increase only covers 60% of our budget. That makes clear that cuts, substantial cuts, across the board will be required. This is what the schools will be faced with, and it's a fact. It's not fiction. It's fact borne out by the numbers. Lastly, I would like to highlight again the fact that as a school district, Cape Elizabeth spends less per pupil than Cumberland, Falmouth, Freeport, Yarmouth, and South Portland. We spend below the mean across all categories. How do we do this? Well, our town benefits greatly from the extraordinary hard work of our teachers, students, parents, volunteers, and boosters, and from the singular, unique cooperation between the municipal and school administrators. Our school's budget and town budget are far from being a bottomless pit, as it has been referred to. Thank you. Thank you. I'm Ann Gale. I live at 10 Loxley Road. It's G-A-L-E. I attended the April 13th school board presentation of the proposed 2006-2007 school budget to the Town Council Finance Committee and have a few reflections on that evening. First, I'd like to express the unfortunate timing of the April 13th presentation. It was held not only on Passover and Holy Thursday, but also on the eve of April vacation, preventing many people from attending. At the presentation, three town councilors maintained that school enrollments have declined since the time the 3.4% spending cap was adopted, and thereby justified their adherence to the spending cap. The argument that evening was based on a narrow calculation of enrollment that considered outgoing high school seniors this spring as well as incoming kindergartners for the fall. The math did not consider what is happening at the other grade levels, nor did it consider enrollment increases that have occurred since the cap was adopted. There is clearly tremendous ambiguity in the enrollment numbers, and there is much riding on them. Perhaps the current process of estimating the enrollments at budget time and then hoping that reality will match up with the projections is flawed. Perhaps the budget process needs some kind of an additional mechanism built in to allow for evaluating actual enrollments once they have occurred and adjusting the budget based on these actual figures. This would avoid basing our school budget on forecasted enrollment numbers that have proven to be underestimates in each of the last five years. The language of the spending cap clearly states that additional funds will be made available for increased school enrollments and population growth. My question to Councillors Fritz, Lynch, and Swift Kayata at this time is, if you can be shown that enrollments have indeed increased since making your 3.4% pledge, would you defend the second part of the pledge as adamantly as you defend the first part? That is, would you make allowances in the school budget for enrollments as you promised to? As a nine-year Cape resident, I have seen my taxes steadily rise, yet I believe that the tax increase resulting from the adoption of the school board's budget is an investment worth making, as do the nearly 700 residents who signed a statement of support for our schools. I continue to add names daily to the statement of support without any solicitation. It is time to seek alternative revenue sources to fund our schools. Perhaps this includes tapping Fort Williams in some way. It is time for individuals representing the many different perspectives of this budget discussion to sit at a table together and create a strategy for how to fund our schools appropriately and reasonably so that a budget debate of the scale we are currently engaged in is not an annual event. I encourage you, our town council, to advocate for our schools, as so many residents hope you will do. 
I appreciate this opportunity to share my thoughts and thank you for your commitment to this town through your service on our council. Thank you. Sue Pierce, P-I-E-R-C-E, 59 Hunts Point Road. First, I would like to thank the school board for reevaluating the enrollment projections for next year. It is no surprise, based on the immigration trends of the past few years, people moving into town and into the school system, that the projection shows a flat or one student increase, even with a very large graduating class. Cape enrollment has shown a steady increase, as Rebecca said, over the past seven years, a total increase in enrollment of 115 students. But this is not about enrollment. This is about adequately funding our school system. This is about a decision that was made in a time of panic with probably the best intentions. Although the spending cap resolution was publicized, I must admit, it never made it on my radar screen. When I voted no on Pulaski, I did not vote yes to a spending cap. With a 3.4% spending cap, the school budget does not even cover the increase in current benefits and salaries and increase in energy costs. It falls short by over $275,000. Just running these numbers, not going any further, it was clear that our schools would be hurt by this cap. To meet this cap, approximately $220,000 would need to be cut in school staffing. Jack Roberts, a former counselor, voted against the cap. He said he did not see a cap as a form of property tax relief, but rather a deferral of costs. This I agree with. The school board will once again need to defer costs to replace classroom furniture, old textbooks, and capital improvement projects. These needs will not go away. Costs will just be put off again and will cause a bigger hit to the budget down the road. At the April 13th meeting, a compromise budget with an approximate 5.5% increase was put forward. Although I feel the school needs the 6.95% budget approved by the school board, I greatly appreciate the spirit of compromise. Although many of the costs will still need to be deferred and new staffing positions could not be added, at least current staffing would stay intact. This proposed compromise budget, supported by Councillor Moles, Dills, and McKenney, would increase total property taxes on a median, median home, I believe, by $85.62 per year, or $7.13 per month. I believe that if we took this budget to vote, the voters of Cape Elizabeth would overwhelming, overwhelmingly support this reasonable increase. I know what is at risk is breaking a promise. The counselors supporting this compromise budget looked at the minimal needs of our schools, and I hope that the other counselors will reconsider and look at the real school needs. Any increase over the 3.4% spending cap should not need to be justified by an enrollment number, but by doing what is best for the Cape community, our children, and the future students of Cape Elizabeth. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. I'm Tom Brigham, B-R-I-G-H-A-M, and I live at 34 Rockcrest Drive. Some of you may remember that I worked with you on Cape's Pulaski Tax Cap Task Force. As I recall, during those meetings, there was much discussion about controlling municipal spending and property tax rates. But I also recall that there was discussion pertaining to the core values or guiding principles that were important to the members of our community. When we were done, there seemed to be a clear consensus that this community supported maintaining a quality education system. I support your efforts to control our municipal spending, but I ask you to not lose sight of those important guiding principles, which included a recognition of the importance of education. And please keep that in mind when you make your decisions on this current budget. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Brigham. Now, is there anyone who would like to speak in favor of something less than the school board's recommended budget? My name is Charlie McCarthy. 
M-C-C-A-R-T-H-Y. live at 12 Stony Brook Road, have for the past 38 years. I have four children that graduated from the school, two grandchildren. Certainly I'm in favor of education. However, I want you to keep in mind a goodly number of the citizens who are older, fixed income, having difficulty staying within the town because of this. We have rising costs, the same as the school says it has. I have to manage my income so that I may maintain my position where I live. I just ask you to keep us in mind. We don't have any organization representing us. We're individuals in need of your consideration. Please keep us in mind when you start spending our money. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. McCarthy. My name is Kathleen Kent, K-E-N-T, and I live at 74 Wells Road. I'm here to speak today because I too think that our schools are a vital part of our community. In terms of the budget, however, they are a dominant part of our community. And as we take these budget considerations into our thoughts, I think we need to review how much we already have in our school systems. I've had children in the schools for 14 years now. And I just would like to review the changes I've seen in those years. <clears throat> Excuse me. The buildings. Fourteen years ago, our buildings were in extreme disrepair. At that time, it was probably true to say the roof was going to cave in if we didn't raise the budget. That is no longer true. In the last 12 years, our schools have been thoroughly renovated. The money was well spent. Our buildings are now spacious, bright, and inviting. In addition to classroom and office space, each building has a state-of-the-art library, computer lab, gymnasium, art and music areas, cafeteria, and auditorium space. While our buildings are more than adequate, they do need to be maintained. Broken windows need to be replaced. But without the need for renovation, maintenance should occur within a 3.4% budget increase. In terms of curriculum, and this is in response to some of what I read in the newspaper. I know the K through 12 science curriculum has been revised in the last 10 years. The high school science curriculum has been revised in the last four. In addition, I read online that the elementary school recently implemented a new curriculum. And while I don't know what has occurred elsewhere, we have a curriculum facilitator on staff and we fund eight to 10 in service days each year. With those tools in place, I would think we could, additional curriculum needs could be accomplished within our 3.4% budget. Resources. Please examine the school website to see the wealth of opportunities offered to all our students. There are far too many to list here. The high school reads as a prep school. 30 clubs and activities, 36 sports teams, 11 AP courses, and electives in every subject area from science to phys ed. We have so much, it is hard to see how a 3.4% budget increase will compromise the quality of our education. Enrollment. No matter how I look at the numbers, I have to conclude that the enrollment increases that occurred in the 90s have now stabilized. In the early 90s, class sizes averaged less than 100, then swelled to a range of 130 to 150 per grade. In fact, our current seniors in first grade, I believe, had 168 students. Now, however, those class sizes have stabilized in the range of 130 to 150. By my count, based on the school telephone directly, we have 150 average in the high school, 143 average in the middle school, and 137 average, one through four, in the elementary school. Ms. Kent, if you can start to wrap up for us, please. All right. Our energy costs certainly have increased. And just to summarize, we have a great deal already in terms of buildings, resources, enrollment is stable, energy costs certainly have increased. But in light of all that we already have, I would propose that we can continue to provide an excellent education 
while being mindful of the needs of the community as a whole and work within a 3.4% budget. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Kent. Gary Cummings, C-U-M-M-I-N-G-S, 36 Richmond Terrace. I'm not going to single out the school department. <clears throat> I just, from what I've read, there was a promise made a couple of years ago to hold the budget down. Uh, I personally expect the council to honor that. The two new councils, I think you inherit that responsibility. And if that formula that they devised two years ago allows for an increase in the budget through population, because I don't know if there's been increases or not, then that's fine. But if there hasn't, then I think we've got to hold to that promise and work within that formula to get this budget, whether it be for the municipal or for the school department. If there's a promise made, uh, I expect it to be honored. I would honor my promises. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Cummins. Hello, Laura Grass and Drake, G R A S S I N hyphen Drake, D R A K E, at 9 Wainwright Drive. I can't speak quite as well as the woman who spoke a couple of moments ago, but what I would like to address is, is the idea that education is one of those kinds of expenses, like medicine, that there's never enough. We always need more, we could always find more, we can always improve it. But it is a public school system we're funding, not a private school system. And as such, it needs to be balanced against other public needs as well. And my concern is that while we have many people in Cape Elizabeth who are very well-to-do, we also have people in Cape Elizabeth who um, probably struggle to make current property tax bills. Whether they're on fixed budgets or whether they're lower middle income. And I would not want to see over time these people forced out because they can't afford Cape Elizabeth anymore. And as a result, our society here become a more singular society. Um, I think it's, it's morally wrong to be demanding too much of people who can't do more. And to me, it does seem that this is not a cap. It is growth. It is 3.4% increase. Um, we do have a very good school system. And as a couple of other people have argued, that 3.4% that cap, cap increase um, is, should be enough to still maintain a good school system might not bring some of the improvements we would like to see, but it needs, it needs to be balanced against the needs of other citizens as well, not just those who feel that schools should be getting um, more and more each year at the expense of property taxes. Okay. Thank you, Ms. Crescent and Drake. Barbara Schenkel, S-C-H-E-N-K-E-L, <clears throat> 32 Belfield Road. I don't think anybody in this room would deny that we want to have excellent schools and we want the best for the children in Cape Elizabeth. However, I don't think that the proposal to hold expenses at an increase of three point, no more than 3.4% is unreasonable. This, the population, according to what I got from the school superintendent's office, um, increased by 19 students from 2004 to 2005 or 2004 five, five, six school year. And the projections I got was that they, it was to go down from 1,847 students measured on October 1st to 1,831 students measured on October 1st, October 1st of the next year. Even if the student population is stabilized. Those were the superintendent's numbers, not mine. Um, even if this population is stable and increases by one student, that doesn't require a 7% increase in our taxes. 3.4%, even with the increase in energy costs, should be adequate. 
Not too many additional teachers should be needed for not having any growth in, or not much, in the student population. We keep being asked to fund school buildings, bonds. We just are in the process of paying for bonds right now for the kindergarten building. And I think if the school board works hard and the school department works hard, they can find ways to trim in areas that may not be quite as important as other areas. I think that's their charge. I'd like to remind people, everybody in this room, that fewer than one-third of this town, of the households in this town, have children in this school system. And we are all bearing the brunt and the responsibility, and most of us gladly, as long as it's not unreasonable, of funding the schools. And I agree with the person who said there are people in this town who are probably struggling to pay their property taxes, and many of them are part of those, the two-thirds or more, who do not have children in the school district. So I'm asking you to please stick with no more than a 3.4 percent increase in the overall budget. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Schenkel. Let's move to the other side of the street um, with five people who would like to present an opposing view to the last five. And again, I encourage anyone who would like to speak on aspects of the budget other than school to feel free uh, to comment on the municipal budget, community services budget, special funds budget, if there are comments. But if people want to focus their comments primarily on the school budget. Good evening, Councillor Cynthia Garfield, Abaco Drive. I'm a 1983 graduate of Cape Elizabeth High School, and I was fortunate to have received the first 13 years of my education at this school system. And I'm concerned that um, the quality might be slipping. Um, after leaving college, I lived with my husband in Portland for a number of years. And we enjoyed the beaches and the open space here in Cape Elizabeth simply by driving across the bridge. The one reason why I moved back here was because I had children. And I didn't want them in the Portland school system. I wanted them in the wonderful school system that I enjoyed. The time that I attended, the student-teacher ratio was about 1 to 20. There was never a class over 20 students. And anyone in education will tell you that class sizes are very important, and they are over 20 now. Um, I could speak for more than three minutes, but I will not. I um, have much to say, but I'm going to focus on some things that other people haven't mentioned. I do not believe in spending caps. I'm among the 70 percent of CAPE voters who defeated the Pulaski Initiative. Further, I did not vote in favor of the Council's resolution to self-impose a spending cap because that item was not up for public vote. Many share my view that a cap is too restrictive and a and does not allow for adjustments to unforeseen or extraordinary circumstances or normal growth. The Council has clearly explained their reason for deciding amongst themselves to pass the 3.4 percent spending cap as the lesser of two evils, that a state-mandated tax cap would have decimated our ability to fund education, which is true. They hope to avert passage of Pulaski by acting locally, and they continue to hold that if we can control spending in our small town and other towns do the same, then we can avoid future passage of state mandated caps like Tabor. The problem with this strategy is that other towns in our area are not able to hold spending to the CPI. So our small voting block will not be large enough to prevent passage of a statewide bill. I cite some examples of 2007 budgets recently approved in our neighboring towns. Scarborough's 2007 school budget is increasing 7% with the overall increase of 8% for the town while South Portland's budget is up over 5% as recently reported in the century. If inflation in our bordering towns is over 5%, how can we be insulated from the same growth in costs? What secrets of cost control and efficiency could our school department know about that the neighboring towns do not? There is no secret. There is simply the realization that quality would have to be sacrificed to meet a tax cap. The CPI is on the rise. I would assume that a pledge to link spending to the CPI includes a provision to adjust the cap as the CPI fluctuates. Or in practice, at the time the budget is approved each year, it would tie to the most recent CPI actuals, not to the CPI of 2004. For the first three months of 2006, consumer prices increased at a seasonally adjusted annual rate of 4.3 percent. 4.3 percent. 
This compares with an increase of 3.4 percent for all of 2005. My source is the U.S. Department of Labor Bureau of Statistics, April 19, 2006. That's last week. It's time to recalibrate the cap. The pledge by which the pledge to which a block of counsel is adhering does not have provisions to exceed the CPI. Uh, sorry, does have the provision to exceed the CPI by the amount of school enrollment increases and extraordinary expenses. If you Therefore, can start to wrap up, please, Ms. Garfield. Okay. Um, Therefore, it's important that all parties agree on the most realistic estimates for 0708 school enrollment. It's time to scrap the flawed predictions supplied by market decisions. It makes more sense to use our own local formula, which I would describe if you did the time. Um, and it actually, I, I have a local formula that I came up with. It's called the drive around method. And it comes up, my method, I'm a financial analyst, I come up with flat enrollment. Um, with an increase actually of like 10 students. So I agree with what Rebecca Miller uh, stated. And it has to do with new home construction. And okay, we're going to ask you to wrap it up. OK, I'm sorry. Um, so I ask the bottom line is that in the spirit of the, the tax cap pledge, apply the formula to be the new CPI 4.3 plus a half a percent for enrollment amounts to 4.8%. And I need to uh, note that taxpayers should note that a 5% increase in spending would not mean a 5% increase in their taxes. This is because revenue is increasing at the same time. We have an additional 489000 coming in for Ms. state Garfield, education. Ms. Garfield, please. I'm very sorry. Um, in closing, I'd like to see the school board's proposed budget approved. Good evening, my name is Trish Brigham, B-R-I-G-H-A-M, and I live at 34 Rockcrest Drive. First, thank you for the time and effort which you've dedicated to the service of the community, in particular the arduous budget process. And thank you also for listening to the public at this hearing tonight. There have been so many facts and figures presented over the past few weeks related to the school budget that at times it's been mind-numbing. There are a couple of facts, however, that I think warrant added emphasis. First, the CPI of 3.4 percent, which arguably is not the statistic which best represents the cost structure of a school system, since a school system's costs are primarily driven by labor rather than bundled consumer products. That aside, I think it is important to reiterate that a 3.4 percent spending increase does not translate into a 3.4 percent tax increase. A 3.4 percent budget represents a tax decrease of 0.15 percent. The school board approved budget with a spending increase of 6.95 percent increase tax, increases taxes about 4 percent. This dynamic, again, is due, as Cynthia Garfield mentioned, is due to the fact that after years of declining support, the state has increased our aid for education, and there's been a change in the school funding formula. The other number I want to talk about is 2.3 percent. This figure was included in the school board's budget presentation to the town council several weeks ago and represents the school board's estimate of real growth, net of debt, in school spending over the past five years after adjustment for inflation and student population increases. That is 2.3 percent over five years, not 2.3 percent per year. This implies a growth rate of under 1 percent per year to address the added demands placed on school systems in this time period, and there have been many. During the past five years, schools have had to deal with the testing and reporting requirements of a new federal law known as No Child Left Behind, the main learning results, and its comprehensive list of academic and social education requirements, which must be satisfied in order to prepare students for graduation, and the requirement that each school district in Maine develop a comprehensive local assessment system. In addition, schools, like businesses, have had to respond to increasing technology demands. All of these mandates must be met. Yet over a five-year period, the incremental resources which the schools were given to accomplish them has been nominal. The challenge of moving the school system forward and initiating improvements while meeting ongoing demands becomes obvious. The options available to business enterprises or even private households when faced with this challenge are not necessarily available to a highly regulated public education system. I heard from many community residents that they value as education, as I'm sure you do. So presumably, we are all on the same track. I have also heard many people express the belief that the schools are excelling, or they're already good enough. So maybe we are on the right track. But as Will Rogers said, even if you're on the right track, you'll get run over if you just sit there. <laughs> Restrictive spending may save taxpayers money in the short term, but the maintained mode of operation necessitated by spending caps tied to inflation 
may prove more costly to taxpayers and the students who get left behind in the long term. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Brigham. I'm Jana Zimmerman, Z-I-M-M-E-R-M-A-N, live at 81 Oak Coast Road with a third grader from Pond Cove. Um, I looked at the middle school. There's a big poster on the wall that's about our mission. And it says it includes becoming a top public school. Now, I've done a tremendous amount of research. You can tell I moved from Dallas, probably, somewhere in Texas. And I was researching private schools there. And there are a number of top schools in Dallas, at least from our perspective. And then we moved to Maine, and I researched here. And I decided on Cape. That's where I saw the middle school books. This, I should tell you, I graduated from college in 1979. This science book that our sixth graders are using today, a couple of them were in the homework, uh, little basket for homework. It was published in 1983. First time was 1980. Well, in the 22 years, maybe 23, since the sixth grade science book was published, a few more discoveries have been added <laughs> to the world scientific database. Our book, this lovely book here, which is in pretty good shape when you compare it to the seventh and eighth grade Spanish books, and they were published a little sooner, 1996 and 1997. A lot, much younger books. But our book leaves off with the early travels of Voyager 1 and Voyager 2 to Jupiter, where they found volcanoes, Saturn, where they saw some rings. And according to our book, Voyager 2 was planning to hit in 1986, at least go by Uranus. <laughs> That's where we leave off. Now, we don't have the sequel. <laughs> and I bet there have been a number of sequels. I'm not a science major. I'm a neuropsychologist. I am driven by data. So that's why I brought you these lovely books. This is the fifth grade science book. Now, the secretary at the middle school is a wealth of information. Her children went through these public schools. And this was their book. Now, they've long since left. And it's not because they dropped out or anything. They're grown up. So, this is not my idea of an excellent school district. It's not my idea of a top school district. It's not even my idea of an adequate school district. And maybe I have high ideals. I don't know. But I personally find it unconscionable that we would have books like this in our schools and that we consider we are willing to compromise our children's academic future and undermine their competitiveness. And it is a competitive world out there. And it is scientifically and technologically based. And my child is not the best speller in the world. And as a neuropsychologist, I'm thinking maybe she needs the middle school laptop where they have spell check. I'm hoping that's still available to her. I think... If you can start to wrap up for us, please. Yes. I think that this 1983 book might explain our 8th grade science MEA results, or at least help us understand them better, where we partially met the standards with a 536 standard score. 66% of the eighth grade, this is eighth grade, I'm looking ahead, two years past this book, we're partially meeting the standards. That's in 2004, 2005, same story, 2003, 2004. I would urge you, I would beg you, please, I'm going to head to Katy, Texas if you don't. I'm doomed, but I'm kidding, but I would urge you to support the budget and help our schools become adequate. Thank, Thank you, Ms. Zimmerman. Anthony Wing Kosner, KOSNER, 9 Reef Road. Um, uh, I may be missing something, um, but I think there were a few 
dots that can be connected. Um, the spirit of the tax cap, I believe, spending cap, is to keep a cap on taxes. Um, and the concerns of our low income and fixed income residents uh, are that the taxes not increase more than their income, more than their fixed income. Um, if Social Security is tied to the Consumer Price Index, and we just heard that the current number for the Consumer Price Index is 4.3%, and we just heard that approving the school board's budget would raise the overall taxes by 4%, it seems to me that you have a compromise here. It seems to me that you can support the school budget and still have the tax increase come in under the consumer price index. That should satisfy people unless they're trying to use the spending cap as a way of rolling back taxes, as a way of taking money out of the system. I haven't heard anybody who's in favor of the cap get into the nitty-gritty that the people who are in favor of the budget get into. All people say is, you should be able to do it for 3.4%. They don't get into the fact that, uh, that the uh, uh, health insurance has gone through the roof, that the energy has gone through the roof, that special education has gone through the roof, and all of these factors are multiplying factors. The reason why the, the enrollment is flat or increasing is because people are moving here. If, if only a third of the people in the town have kids in the school district now, five years from now, maybe that number will be 45%. Because Cape Elizabeth is a magnet for people who have kids because it has a good school district. So you have to look at it as a moving target, not as a static thing. And what I hear is, um, what I heard at the last meeting was that the people who are in favor of loosening the spending cap have the right intention, didn't have the right numbers. All the numbers seemed a little mushy. The people who were in favor of holding the cap had very clear numbers, but they were the wrong numbers. So this is, this is the big problem we have in politics in this country, is that you know, we have, we have the, the right numbers that are wrong, and then we have the, the right idea that doesn't have the right numbers. I'm trying to propose that we have the right numbers with the right intention. You can pass the budget and still keep taxes under control. Thanks. Thank you. Anyone else who would like to speak? Yes? Are we still? We are Which? still on Mr. Cosner's side. <laughs> OK. <laughs> um, my name is Rebecca Dadman, D-A-D-M-U-N. I live at 602 Preble Street. Um, I have two children in school, kindergarten and fifth grade. And um, I don't have any notes because I didn't intend to speak. But um, I would like to speak as a member of the group that struggles financially. Um, my husband and I, we do budget for our taxes, but I would like to say that I would still be in support of the school board's budget. Um, and I would appreciate all of you considering that, um, that budget to support our schools and to support Cape Elizabeth across the board, because that's what our education does for us. Thank you. Thank you. Shall we move to the other side of the aisle? <laughs> Is there anyone else who would like to speak? Mr. DeSena. Um, question on procedure here. I have a letter that uh, Phineas Sprague wanted me to read to the people, or should I give it to you? Um, I think it would be appropriate to, to give it to the council. 
um, unless you want to read it as part of your three-minute no, presentation. No, thank you. <laughs> thank you, and we'll make copies and disseminate this to the council. Um, build a center, 11 Wainwright Drive, D-E-S-E-N-A. And uh, before anyone misconstrues my position here, I am a strong supporter of education like everyone in this room and have a long lineage of evidence for that. If you have any questions, I just don't want to be tarred and feathered because I am a fiscal conservative that believe these figures need are flawed in one sense. I think all intentions are very good. I think the schools are excellent. I originally was concerned about the quality when I started hearing a lot of rhetoric about we're going to lose the quality of our teaching. So I went to the efforts of looking at five years of MEA scores for all main schools and found that in fact the CAPE is at the top and there's no sign of any faltering. So that gave me great relief and I'm asking myself, well gee whiz, why do we need all this money if we're at the top? And I'm very happy we're at the top if we can do it with these kind of books. It takes a very minimal amount of money to change that little problem. The issues that seem to be concerning a lot of the, there was a lot of uh, chatter about enrollment, which frankly I don't think makes a bit of difference because you've got all costs fixed. I mean you've paid for your heat, your electric, your, your wages, insurance, fuel, everything. The only thing you've got left is to buy whatever new seats you need or chairs. And uh, it, my calculations say very simply taking the school projections of 110 next year and subtracting the graduating class of 154 and the unspoken amount that are graduating from the eighth grade, which are six, that I, I mean, yeah, six. And that brings you to a net decline of 50. I don't care if it's zero or if it's a decline of five or if it's an increase of five. The trend is down or flat throughout the state and the projections by the state on all public enrollment is six to seven percent down over the next six or seven years. That's confirmed by my conversations with a couple of cool school districts in the area. They're seeing a decline as we speak. Okay, why are we adding new teachers? Maybe they're needed, but if you're not adding new students, I don't know why you need them. If you do add one school teacher, you've got a minimum of $30, $30,000 expense, which can go to your fuel. That's a little bit of my complaint, the fuel cost. But you've locked yourself into a 20-year obligation after that teacher's been with you for two years. That's a million bucks on a simple, mathematic, no pension, no escalation factor. So you've got to give consideration. I'm, con I'm concerned about the figures here. We throw out a lot of money, but it doesn't come back. There have been savings in painting the school buildings ourselves of nearly a quarter of a million dollars. It doesn't get credited to the next year. Mr. DeSena, the okay. three minutes does pass quickly. I, I will be very quick, wrap it up. Evidence, um, Cape Falmouth has an enrollment increase of 60 people. They've got factored in there 230 for oil, and they are 4.75. Uh, Freeport has just put a 4% cap on their school. Uh, Greeley has a CPI plus debt service. And their projected budget came in under that. So we should review this. I think if you don't stick with your pledge, you've got a problem with Tabor. Thank you, Mr. DeSena. Other speakers? I'm on the other, other side. Is that OK? Um, unless there is anyone who would like to follow uh, Mr. DeSena and speak as speak to a budget other than the recommended school budget or as to any other aspect of the budget. My name is Sarah Lennon, L-E-N-N-O-N, -N -N, and I live at 54 Cranbrook Drive. 
A few years ago, I went to visit my parents, then ages 75 and 82, in a small town in Massachusetts where I grew up. What's news? I asked upon arrival. Well, said my mom, we went to the town meeting yesterday to debate and vote on a funding override for the school budget. It was quite a heated discussion. So I asked, how did you guys vote? With a reproachful glance, she answered, we voted for the override. Why, I asked, it doesn't benefit you. Because it's our responsibility, that's why, she answered. Because when you all were kids in the school, others gave gladly so you could have the best schools. And now, it's our turn. And to that, my dad added, besides, it's just the right thing to do. Allow me to consider what he meant. Why is, a fully fun why is fully funding a school system the right thing to do? It's right because a healthy society invests in its youth. America was built on the notion that each generation would strive to do a little better than the one before. It's right because we have made a mess out there, fiscally, politically, environmentally. And as we hand the world over to our children with an apologetic shrug, it seems only fair that we send them out there with a few tools they will need for the cleanup. Wisdom, flexibility, cultural awareness, knowledge of history, literature, and science. In short, a first-rate education. It's right because it's the natural evolution of a society. Worldly goods should be passed along. But in the end, I think my dad spoke to a deeper truth. Giving something of yourself, something you have worked hard to earn, is one of life's greatest gifts. To nurture a community's children actually brings gratification to the provider himself. In the final analysis, then, whether we choose to help our kids to improve their future says more about us than it does about them. This is a decision we need to make as a town, as a small community in the context of our, of our larger country. Collectively, we should be asking, who are we, what do we value, and where are we headed? Let's consider what a few others have said on the subject. The Dalai Lama, judge your success by what you have had to give up in order to get it. Mahatma Gandhi, in a democratic scheme, money invested in the promotion of learning gives a tenfold return to the people. Martin Luther King, Jr., Every man must decide whether he will walk in the light of creative altruism or in the darkness of destructive selfishness. Nelson Mandela. There can be no keener revelation of a society's soul than the way in which it treats its children. In the spirit of these great men who struggled to rebuild the societies in which they lived, let us strive to be altruistic. Members of the Council, I implore you, pass the budget that the school board has submitted. These are responsible, well-informed people who have requested a very reasonable budget. Give them all that they have requested, all 7.5 percent. You'll be happier for it. And to all the citizens of this town, I would say, let us look into our hearts, lighten our spirits, elevate our sights, and open up our checkbooks. Let us pay our taxes, not angrily. If you could wrap up for us, please. Not feeling resentful and put upon, but rather joyfully, filled with appreciation that we live in a country that educates us all so democracy can thrive. For, as Nelson Mandela observed, education is the most powerful weapon which you can use to change the world. Let us share. It is our responsibility, our right, and indeed, our privilege. Let us pass this budget because, as my dad so simply said, it's just the right thing to do. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Lennon. Uh, good evening. I'm uh, Joe Spagnola, S-P-A-G-N-O-L-A, -A, and live at 2 Heatherstone Lane. Um, I am certain that many citizens will be disappointed when the final budget is passed in May. However, there is some good news that has come out of the spending cap controversy, and that is community awareness. I hope all the people who have been involved with this year's budget, whether it was on the municipal side or at the school level, will stay involved going forward. We need to continue to help our elected officials 
because Cape Elizabeth is at a critical juncture. We cannot have it all. Great schools, excellent municipal services, lower property taxes, open space, and no commercial development. Something has to give. So stay involved, do not get frustrated or discouraged, because as a group, we can and will make a difference. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Spagnola. My name is Debbie Fisher, and I'm F-I-S-H-E-R. I live at 9 High Bluff Road. I strongly believe that the town council should override the 3.4% spending cap. The town's website states that, in regard to our school system, our vision for the future is to, quote, create a dynamic organization that inspires an upbeat, innovative, and collaborative environment that results in a high level of learning and achievement for all. The tax cap limits our ability to achieve that goal. A quick example. Three weeks ago, a group of eighth graders competed in the National History Day meet up in Augusta, and they won. They've been invited to represent the state of Maine in the National History Competition in Maryland in June. However, the school's unable to financially support this achievement because there's no money available. This is indicative of the situation in which we find ourselves, and it's only going to continue with the institution or with the continuation of this tax cap. I strongly urge you to override the spending cap so that we can financially support the economic, ac academic excellence that comes with an upbeat, innovative, and collaborative school system. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Fisher. Hi, my name is Janet Andrews, and I live at 18 Chevrous Road, A-N-D-R-E-W-S. Five years ago, I moved from Alabama to the state of Maine so that I could get a much better education for my child. After living in Scarborough for one year, all I heard was about what a great community Cape Elizabeth is and what a wonderful school system they have. So after a year, we moved to Cape Elizabeth where my son started attending first grade. I'm a single mom. I work two jobs. I try to volunteer wherever I can. I struggle. I'm, again, one of those lower income families. My son goes to community services. We utilize all of their services. I totally su support the school board and their recommendation. And if I need to, I would go out and get a third job, just so that if it means an increase in my taxes to do so, so that not only my child can get the best education, but all future children that come through the school system. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Andrews. Hi, I'm Dan Fishbein, F-I-S-H-B-E-I-N, 19 Salt Spray Lane. And I just wanted to address two issues quickly. One is there's been a lot of comments about you know, people protecting their self-interest and worried about taxes, and I'm very worried about that as well. But I'd like all those who are boiling this down to a personal economic issue to think really about the economics they have at stake. Our houses, everybody who owns a house in this room, has a house that's worth probably twice what it would be worth in almost any other community in Cumberland County. And the one and only reason why that's true is our school system. We have the best, or historically, one of the best school systems in the county. People move here and pay more for those houses. Yet, if you listen to what was said earlier, we are now paying below the mean per student in what we fund for our school system. We're below most of the other towns in Cumberland County. So you might say, well, then we're, it's terrific, we still have the best school system, we really must have great people who've been able to do that, and that's exactly the point. We're kind of living on the long tail of the past. 
We have teachers who are incredibly dedicated to this town and who have stayed here despite the fact that we're supporting the schools less and less. We have great parents, we have great students, but over time that will catch up with us. If everyone else funds their schools more generously than we do, our schools will not be as good as their schools. And you can expect the value of your house to go down, maybe by half. So you have more economic self-interest in maintaining a top school system than in $85 a year in property taxes. The other thing I just wanted to comment on was when we voted on the Pulaski tax cap, we did not vote on your tax cap. I fully understand and appreciate why you did what you did, and in fact my wife was involved in some of the same volunteer activities, but we did not have a referendum on the 3.4% cap. We never voted on that. The only tax cap we ever voted on was Pulaski, and we turned it down 70 to 30. So the only evidence you have in front of you as to what the town genuinely thinks of an arbitrary tax cap is a 70-30 defeat. And it's completely illogical to claim that because we rejected a tax cap, we favor a tax cap. And somehow the history has gotten twisted around that to say by voting 70-30 against a tax cap, that means we all voted for a tax cap. We didn't. And I'd ask you to consider that, and I strongly endorse the school department, the school board's budget. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Fishbein. Hi, I'm Dina DeSena, 11 Wainwright Drive. I've been involved very seriously in schools for 24 years. I've been on many boards, some of the best schools in the country, University of Virginia, Hotchkiss, um, Spent School in New York, St. David's, Sacred Heart. I've had a few. At any rate, I, you know, it's interesting, there's, a, there's one side or the other. And I'd like to say that money doesn't necessarily make a better education. In fact, I was with a principal today that was talking about there are people in the United States who think you're only smart, if, if you're only successful if you're smart. And he said, what about if you just work hard? What about if parents said, you know, you go to work, study your books, you know, and, and I, I expect you to do well in school. And all I'm saying, if you, you can take millions of dollars and throw it at a school system, and will that make it better? What about inspiring teachers to be, you know, the best teacher they can be? What about, you know, um, giving bonuses to teachers that do better or inspire our own children to, um, you know, reach higher than they could. What about saying, I know you can do it as a student and put them into a more difficult situation and see these kids rise. I'm not saying that school districts need money. I don't need money. They obviously need money to keep going. But I'm not sure throwing money randomly at kids or at school systems um, when you can't make a change in, in the inspiration and make a change in teachers and make a change in attitude, does it? And that's all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. DeSena. Good evening. Um, my name is Susan Spagnola. I live at 2 Heatherstone Lane. And first, I would like to thank you all for your service to the community and for this public hearing. I cannot help but wonder if this evening is somewhat of an exercise in futility, since your minds essentially have been made up on the budget. As such, I would like to focus not on today, but the future. In her presentation at the meeting the Thursday before vacation that was unfortunately very sparsely attended, School Board member Rebecca Millett revealed to you the financial impact of the third year of a spending cap. That would be next year. Assuming a conservative CPIU of 2.74%, the schools will be allowed to spend an additional $500,000 next year. However, 
Increases in salaries and other expenses are projected to be $1.3 million, leaving our schools an $800,000 deficit. I would ask all of you on the Town Council, even though I know it is not your job, where you would find that $800,000 in cuts without impacting the quality of education in Cape Elizabeth, especially given that Mike McGovern's financial bank benchmarks reveal that we are an extremely efficient school system, ranking eighth of 12 in per pupil expenditures in Cumberland County. Here are some possible scenarios. Scenario one, we eliminate our athletic programs at a cost of $443,000. The Achievement Center at a cost of $96,000, and the libraries at the high school and the middle school for a savings of $252,000. Scenario two, we eliminate 16 teaching positions. I could go on, but clearly the situation will be grim. And I truly wonder if historians will view this period in Cape Elizabeth history as the period of school deconstruction that followed the municipal building boom. However, I believe that Cape Elizabeth is made up of bright and able citizens who truly care about their community, and many of you are here tonight. And it is my hope that we will see the dawning of an age of enlightenment, beginning with the election in November. And I encourage Hi, I'm Mary Brett. I live at 7 Steeplebush Road, last name spelled B-R-E-T-T. -T. I just have a really short comment, and that is, I wonder how many of you town councillors have volunteered in classrooms lately. I have four children. I spend two to three times per week in their classes. This is absolutely the hardest job out there. And we have had amazing teachers every single year. And you know, you always hear, well, eventually you're going to hit a down year. We haven't hit a down year. We've had people who've been incredibly dedicated to our kids every single year, including Ingrid Stressinger, Ren Wilkinson, Dottie Anderson, Mary Dulac, Lynn Spadinger, Catherine Cornell, Lynn Evans, Kelly Hassan, Cheryl Higgins, Evan Solander, Mrs. Russ, just because I always call her Mrs. Russ, um, <laughs> Gary Record, um, Mrs. Caruso, because I call her Mrs. Caruso too, and Cheryl Higgins. All of these people have been amazing they are given every single year more and more to deal with in regards to special needs, just communicating with patients, uh, parents. <laughs> that was a slip. Um, communicating with parents who have very, very high expectations. Um, and they, the experience that we've had is these people give everything they've got. And I think the thing that speaks the most to me is not even listening to the school board, but listening to the teachers. And I've spoken with a lot of them, and they're very concerned because they know what it means for their day-to-day -day job. None of us here who are not teachers, we're not doing their job. We're just taking a look at it. And I got to tell you, every single time that I walk out of that classroom, I think, I'm so glad that's not my job. <laughs> that's a really hard job, and they do an amazing job. So I would hope that you would Consider meeting the needs that have been so clearly outlined for you. And, and something that Mrs. DeSena spoke to, Dina spoke to, um, in regards to money. Teachers don't do their job for money, but they need money for personal enrichment. And personal enrichment keeps them enthusiastic about what they do day to day. And if you have a child who has special needs, you need a teacher who's got the skills to deal with them. There's an aide in the room if you're lucky. Um, if not, that teacher is trying to meet all those kids that are gifted or normal or challenged a bit. So please don't penalize our school system because it is a large ticket item. This is, does not seem like an unreasonable budget to me, and I think that it's really imperative that we support our teachers, and what they're asking for. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Brett. Good evening. I'm Jeff Alexander, 31 Reef Road. It's one of the great things about being one of the later speakers is you get to listen to everybody else in the audience and what their perspectives are and, and uh, kind of uh, reflect upon those positions. 
Um, I've lived in the same house uh, for the last 12 years, and like all of us in this town, this town that we love very much, I've watched my taxes go up on a regular basis. And while I'm never crazy about writing that check, I understand where the money's going. And this, uh, this is a town, as we all know, that is essentially fiscally unbalanced. Now, if you think about that, that makes a lot of sense. We have a wonderful school system that's been great for a long time. And a lot of us, whether we have children in the school system now or we did at one point in time, we want to support the schools. There's been lots of talk about this, that this evening. And I think everyone's in agreement to, with that issue. So the real question is, to what degree? Now, we can argue about enrollments and CPI, and we can debate the CPI itself and all those kinds of things. And I think we'll be in this room for a long time debating those issues. But fundamentally, as I came up here, I was thinking, well, who am I really representing? I'm not really representing any particular contingency uh, or contingent of the population. In fact, I think what I'm really representing is the town of Cape Elizabeth. Now, why are we all here today? We're here because we care about this town. And we care about the direction this town is going. We may have some biases uh, that we want to speak to, but fundamentally we care about this town. That's why all of you are sitting there in volunteer positions, dedicating a lot of hours, unpaid, to do what you do. These are hard choices. No one's going to debate that. I happen to support a higher uh, allocation to the school system than what is on the table. Now, whether that number is four and a half or five and a half or seven, uh, we can have another discussion on that issue. But to me, one of the biggest challenges that this town council faces and the people that will follow you and the people that will be in this room in the future is the fundamental mismatch that we have in this town between revenues and expenses. Now, I think it was Ann Gale who said this early on, and I thought, you know, she's really kind of got it. And that is, if we're not careful, if we don't start addressing that fundamental mismatch between revenues and expenses, we're going to be right back here every single year, having these same contentious, and let's face it, this has been contentious, contentious discussions. So what I would argue, once again, as an advocate for the town of Cape Elizabeth and all that it represents, is that we begin to take a step back and address some of those issues that we're going to have to address fundamentally. And I think ultimately we all know deep down in our hearts that that means we're going to have to give in our different areas. Increasing revenues in some ways, cutting expenses in ways that we haven't looked at before. But that's how we're going to get ourselves out of this long-term trend that we're on. Lord knows Mike McGovern probably sees it. So once again, I would support a higher allocation to the school department for this year, but I would also ask you, the town council, and us as residents of this town to get together collectively, and let's begin to have those discussions. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Alexander. My name is Polly Wilcox. I have a frog, but I can't help it. I live at 15 Abaco Drive. Um, I have two kids in the school, uh, 16 years old and a senior. In two years, I'll have nobody in the school. Um, I'm going to say this first. I don't really want to do this, and I could have just cried when I've heard some of these people speak. But I'm doing this because I really think this, is, this could be helpful. And I'm going to tell you, I have a sense of humor, and I use humor. And you guys who've heard me before have laughed hard. See, they know what I've said, and I'm going to say it again. But I use it as a way to help communication. Um, I'm the person, if you saw me on TV when this thing, this was uh, at a school board meeting. I was on TV. I didn't know I was going to be on TV. And I told everybody that, um, uh, let's see, how does this go? I'm older than I, th than I look. And um, I really have all gray hair. And it was very funny at the time, but it doesn't seem funny to me anymore because 
It's sort of sad that I have to get up and say this stuff. I mean, I'm kind of embarrassed to be doing it. But I have to do it because I really wanted to email all of you after I've sat through some, several town council meetings. And I can't do it because I've been working on getting my daughter into music school. And thank the Lord, we've got it done. But it's been so hard this year for us. And um, I, I understand it's very hard. We love our kids and we want to do the right thing. And the other thing is I'm from away, and I was thinking you probably will want me to go away, some of you, after you've heard me tonight. Again, I use my humor. I grew up in Longmeadow, Massachusetts. I lived 25 years in Rochester, New York, in Pittsburgh, most of it. I lived in China for two and a half years. My husband was with Kodak. We lived in Taiwan. So we've had all kinds of schools, situations. Our kids were in China, um, alive and born when, before we went to China. These are some of the things that have come to my mind. Number one, we hired Mr. Hawkins. I cannot evaluate this budget specifically. I'm not smart enough for that, and I'm a big picture person. I don't understand all the details. But what I really like that you said, and as a relative newcomer here, and when I run out of time, I've prioritized things, so I'll just stop. So just tell me when I have. Um, you said um, Yarmouth, Cumberland, and Falmouth had been ramping up their budgets in the last four years or three years, and we had not. So we were playing catch up this year. I thought I wanted to email you, but I couldn't, because I just have been so busy, is that um, perhaps this is going to be something for this year, but maybe we're going to catch up this year, and next year we could be more conservative. That's a thought. Um, so I just wanted to mention that. And that really rang true for me. I thought that was important information. And I don't know. I didn't know the other superintendents. I just knew them a little. But we have had a change of leadership. And perhaps that did mean that sometimes we didn't take care. Maybe that was part of the reason we didn't take care of some things. I don't know. All right. You right. um, asked me to let you know. OK. <laughs> Can I have um, a half a minute? Sure. OK. Some st now, I'm a social worker. I'm a um, master's prepared social worker. Some students' education um, is more expensive. And I don't know how to say this in a nice way. I said to a, a psychologist I talked to two weeks ago, um, residential treatment is very expensive. If you ever have to put a kid in residential treatment, it's $25,000. She told me it was $100,000. I mean, special ed for some kids, that's the extreme, can be very expensive. So please, when you say the numbers aren't that much bigger, realize if you have a kid who has more expensive educational needs, it changes what the numbers mean. 15 kids that don't have extra needs and 15 kids that have four people with extra needs are very different. And I don't mean that in dis to discourage those that are more expensive. I don't know how to say that in a nicer way. The last thing I'll say is um, one of the counselors said a large group of people in this town have incomes of $32,000 a year. I don't know how many that was. I just want to say there are people who are living partly on their assets like us. We're older parents. and. Um, so we're partly living on our assets. We're partly living on fixed income, even though we're going to be putting two kids through college. And that was our choice. The last thing I will say, commitments. Um, if, as a social if you can, worker. A, if, you, if you can okay, I know. come to a conclusion, please. When you make a commitment in a marriage, you try to stick with it. There are times abuse comes in. There are times people talk to a social worker and their life is in jeopardy. And then you break the commitment and you do something about it. And so I feel like just be careful when you use that argument about commitment because sometimes it is better to break it and very sad, but sometimes maybe there's some thought about that. And I don't have any more funny things to say. <laughs> thank you, Ms. Wilcox. No, thank you. It's true, she's back. <laughs> um, Jennifer DeSena, 4 Ivy Road, different DeSena, same family, not related. Um, <laughs> not by blood. Mitt, uh, Chairman Backer, do we have to limit this to three minutes? Yes. We couldn't pay to get this good. <laughs> 
Well, if we're going to go over three minutes, we're going to have to invite everybody back up to you. <laughs> that, that's okay. This is I, I suggest we just get ourselves invited to a DeSena family dinner. Yeah, you, you don't I think that. that's going to be a lot of fun. Um, I'm a past school board member, was on the school board for six years. I do know of what I speak with school board budgets. Um, the school board does not throw money at schools or at problems or um, anything. Every budget that I ever worked on was about as bare bones as you could get. We were not always moving forward in the six years that I was on the school board. It's a very complicated process, and in the first years that I was on the board, the arguments were mostly among the school board members. And let me tell you, they were arguments. They would go on. We would have individual votes on individual line items. Um, over the years, that changed, and the power struggle seemed to develop between the school board and the town council. The town council began setting goals or targets or whatever you want to call it, and because they can't control the school board budget, in essence, as to where the money is spent, only the final figure, it would certainly appear to members of the public and school board members that mental deductions of what town council members didn't agree with were always being made in the budget to come down to a final number oftentimes appearing pretty arbitrary to people who had spent months working on this budget. Um, school board budgets are molded through a, for months by the superintendent, the business manager, administrators, people who are paid money to know how to do this, as well as the long time commitment by school board members who have gone over it and debated amongst themselves, as well as with the administration and the, the um, superintendent and the business manager. Um, in the past, to, to meet past town council caps, or whatever you wanted to call it, goals, whatever they would call them, um, we kept, and because we kept losing state aid, we kept making, there were shortfalls that were made up by either postponing programs, some of which man, were mandated by the learning results, postponing purchases, being creative, and yes, ultimately, we would have to go up in taxes. Um, most of us in this town choose to live here because it's a great place. Ms. Descent, I, I know you're going to find it hard to bully of your three minutes. Or, All right, I'm uh, working on so, it. Okay, Part of the you. reason we live here is because there's no commercial base and because we have good schools. Not the best funded, but very good schools. If we choose to not have a commercial base and we want open space, which is why we live here, the only people who pay for it are the homeowners. And the homeowners are then forced to support the burden of the schools as well as all the town expenditures. To me, it's clear citizens in this town support schools. I think the budget ought to be done by the school board and because they are the best people to know what is necessary and they've gone over it, let me tell you. Um, but the town in two, in, has supported two school bonds in 10 years. And I don't think we can rest on the laurels of our past because um, we're really slipping behind. And the future of our community and the greater good of this town and of the next generation depends on the education of our kids. And one thing, just because it sticks in my craw when if, people say if, only a third of the people in this town have kids in the school district. And if, and if you could make this your last that's point. That's it. That's okay. it. It's only because it's one of those things that drives me crazy. Up to 50% of those people in this, 50% of, of the people in this town are either a parent of a kid or a child K through 12. So that's 50% of this town. It's not a third of this town. Um, a third of this town gets to vote or pay taxes who have kids. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. DeSena. <laughs> Hi, 
Um, my name is Sabina Friedman, and I live at Two Todd Road. And um, I wasn't planning to speak tonight, but I've just heard everyone voice. If, if you could spell your last name for us, Friedman. Yes, it's F R E E D M A N. Thank you. Um, I grew up in India, and I went to school in India, right all the way through high school. And um, you know, my mother was a school teacher for thirty. I'm sorry, Ms. Ms. Friedman. Um, if you can stay at the podium and speak a little bit louder, yes. because we're not. Not hearing you. Hearing you completely. The mic only picks up if you speak straight. Okay. Um, I grew up in India. My mother was a school teacher. And, um, you know, I have sort of a perspective of what education and schooling is like in, in India. And um, there's a lot of public schools, uh, what we call government schools, and private schools. In fact, there's a preponderance of private schools that are, you know, funded by corporations, funds, what have you. But they're not expensive, they're very reasonable. And uh, my mother taught at a public school, whereas I went to a private school. And what we observed is, in India, the, the focus on education is extreme. I mean, you'd see professionals as well as, you know, very poor people sending their kids to good schools, um, either private schools or public schools, um, at the cost of, you know, um, a good standard of life. So, you know, these are people that didn't have a home, lived on the streets. Um, rickshaw drivers that worked till you know all night but they were so proud that they could send their kids to a good school and when I was growing up in the 70s and the 80s I mean India was sort of this um, very socialist state you know wasn't part of the global economy like it is now and I used to wonder you know where is this all going and it's just so interesting now to be you know part of Cape Elizabeth to see what schools are like in America hearing these discussions, seeing the parent involvement, you know, your time put in. Um, and to see the difference in, in how schools are run and how they are financed and where it leads down the road. And, you know, I've heard from people who have said there's, you know, um, a huge financial issue with raising taxes, heard from concerned parents. And I just want to sort of point out at a very high global level that what has happened in India and where India is now with all these educated people. I mean, I would never have thought growing up that India would be in this position. And I see it now. I mean, it's, it's a huge payoff for decades of an investment in a good education. And I think we're amazed. You know, I talk to my family and friends in India, and there's huge discussion, you know, amongst, you know, politicians and educators about, wow, you know, we thought this could happen, but look, it did happen. And really, what it comes down to is a focus on education, a focus on keeping up on science, technology, medicine, and it's made a huge difference. And I think that's something that everyone should keep in mind if you look at the future of um, American students and sort of the future of where America will be, you know, decades down the road. So, thank you. Thank you, Ms. Friedman. <clears throat> Hi, I'm Ann Belden, B-E-L-D-E-N, 56 Stony Brook Road, and um, I serve on the Cape Elizabeth School Board currently. And I'm not here to present any figures, any numbers. They have been presented many times by my school board colleagues who have done that way more aptly than I would be able to. But what I just really wanted to say was something about the process. Um, because there's been a lot of discussion this year about the budget process, and I know that that discussion will continue. Um, and the last couple of months, we've heard the words divisive, we've heard the words contentious, we've heard those here this evening. And, you know, what I've, what I've been thinking about is that, yes, we have very strong differences of opinions. We have different feelings on the town council, some different feelings on our school board. We have the school board and the town council trying to grapple through this. But I guess I'm really not sure that this process truly has been divisive because what we have here is an opportunity to express our opinions and the opinions that I've heard tonight from everybody that I've heard from the town councilors that I've heard from the school board members from our town manager from our superintendent have all been expressed in very respectful ways and what we have is we have very different opinions about what our final school budget should be 
But does that mean that that has to divide our community? Does that make it contentious? What it means is that, you know, as people have pointed out tonight, we all really care about where this ends up. And this is going to end up somewhere, and it's going to be okay. Um, and perhaps we need to learn from this and figure out maybe how we can fine tune or improve upon our process next year. But I just really wanted to say that I think this process has been really excellent and that it has, you know, generated huge passion, huge energy in this community. And it's brought out community members who have never before come to any of these hearings before. I know it's been tough for our new superintendent, Alan Hawkins, just as a brand new superintendent. But, um, and he's really hung in there with all of us. But I, I just, I just want to express that I'm not sure that it is that we are really a divided community. And I just don't want us to portray ourselves like that or, you know, feel angry at our neighbor who feels differently on the budget or angry at our town council who maybe doesn't, you know, support our, the town councilors who don't support our school budget because it's not about being angry. It's just about supporting what you believe. And then we're going to move on and we're all going to be a strong community. And I think that, that we can certainly learn from this and, and, fine-tune it, but I just don't want our community to be labeled um, as a divisive one because I don't think we are. I think we're just passionate and we care. And um, this will, you know, this will end up somewhere and we'll move on. So, thank you. Thank you. Well said, Ms. Belden. Can we clap for her, David? <laughs> <laughs> Does this mean I get to be the last speaker of the night? <laughs> Only if nobody follows you. <laughs> uh, my name is Scott Almendinger from A. Coalfield Road. Last name is A-L-L-M-E-N-D-I-N-G-E-R. I think that qualifies as the longest name of the night. Uh, we've lived here for about um, 11 years now, and uh, I don't work here. I don't work in the state of Maine. I work in Chicago and New York mostly and I'm never home. And the reason that we do that is so that our kids can go to school in Cape Elizabeth. That's a little bit more extreme, I realize, than moving from South Portland to Cape Elizabeth so your kids can go to the school system. But I'm never here so that my kids can go to school in the Cape Elizabeth school system. Having said that, I wasn't sure up until a few minutes ago um, quite how I felt about the 3.4 percent versus the 5.5 versus the 7 plus percent uh, debate. Um, and I was speaking with my wife about it tonight at dinner, and when it turned out that only one of us could come tonight because we couldn't get child care, uh, she said, well, well, you go. Many of you know my wife. Uh, her name is Ann, and she's very passionate about this issue. And she said, well, I think you should go so you could learn something. <laughs> and here's what I learned. Um, from Trish Brigham, I, I learned how completely unrealistic it is to tie the school budget to some arbitrary CPI. Um, the school budget is not based on consumer packaged goods. It's based on service and intellectual property and a lot of things that don't, aren't reflected in the broad-based economy, especially things like compliance with federal mandates, which, again, I, I realize are very, very costly and very complicated. So it's not just buildings. It's, it's the complexities of many, many things. It's not just energy driving this. It's the complexity of many different things. I didn't know until tonight that we lag behind virtually every single, every single quantitative benchmark of our neighboring communities in what we spend on children. Um, I didn't realize that there was no direct increase between increase in, there was no direct correlation between increase in spending and taxes until tonight. I thought it was pretty much a, a dollar for dollar situation. Um, but I think the biggest thing that, that hit me as I was sitting here listening, and especially with Dr. Fishbein talking about the, the impact on home uh, property values and, and things like that, in lieu of any heavy industry or any economy in this town, it really occurred to me that the school system could be said to be the financial engine that drives Cape Elizabeth. And how, how does that work? Well, it drives certainly things, something that we're very... Uh, we're all very uh, interested in, which is property values. But it also drives the financial success of our children down the road. 
many of whom hopefully will come back and live, if not in Cape Elizabeth, somewhere in this area and contribute to the economy. So there's a real financial engine at work here. But it's not all about finances. And uh, I think the most eloquent speeches that I learned from tonight were the people who stood up and said, we're low income, nobody's saving us by capping the school expenditures because we are committed to this. Now, one of the reasons that, that we're able to raise our kids here and I get to work in New York and Chicago is that I haven't always worked. There's been a couple of years when we've actually haven't been low income, we've been zero income, as I was trying to find that elusive job that would allow us to stay here in Maine and raise our kids in Maine and have our kids go to the Cape Elizabeth school system. Mr. Elmendinger, if you can this is the work last your way comment. through. Thank you. Um, and I think it needs to be said, I think it's been hinted at from time to time, but I think it really needs to be said flat out that the reason that we are, have this level of commitment is not financial at all, but it is as a result of the dedicated, capable, and in fact inspired people who work for the Cape Elizabeth school system who have personally touched and affected our children forever. Many of them are in the room tonight. I just wanted to say thank you uh, for that and my support after coming here. <clears throat> My support after, after these learnings tonight is firmly for the increase in the school budget as recommended. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Michael McGovern, town manager. I want, there's been almost no comment in the municipal budget uh, this evening. Uh, and within, I'll try to do this in three minutes. Are you speaking for or against? <laughs> Not going there. I don't want to take up my time. Uh, the town council and school board have long prided themselves on the one town concept and having a consistent treatment of both the municipal government and the school and the municipal uh, side of government. I've, you know, I heard, uh, you know, a couple of references to that. Uh, you know, I just want to point out that if a majority of the town council does decide to look at enrollment and growth, that the equivalent increase on the number of housing units is 82 or two percent. I don't think that should be forgotten. You know, we, we're not going to bring out the troops. We don't, we don't do all those things. Not that the schools do them, but uh, we're facing new stormwater regulations. There's new requirements for police training. There's new OSHA requirements. I just read a new requirement for our emergency preparedness director to go out and have to get 115 credit hours in order to continue in that position, a position we only pay $1,600. In the last few years, there's new roads to take care of in Grover Acres, Wilback Road, Dermot Drive, and other locations, Leighton Farms Road. There's trees, there's catch basins that are contracted that we need to take care of on those new roads. There's snow plowing costs, there's energy costs, there's been uh, additional needs to certify clean election candidates, a greatly expanded interlibrary loan program. There's 28% more cost for the disposal of hazardous materials in part due to a new requirement for the disposal of universal waste, uh, computer monitors, uh, fluorescent lights, mercury lights. Uh, you know, we're not immune from all these things that you're hearing from uh, the school side. We're just not as vocal about it. We, we just don't get it out as much. Uh, the Public Works Union this year's contract is 2.5 percent. I think that, you know, shows a, a level of, of understanding of the situation. That's what the Teamsters Union agreed to for this year. Uh, the police union has been 10 months without a contract, uh, has been picketing, and you know, our, our problems are there as well. And I would hope that whatever the council does, that it be consistent, that it follows the one town concept, that if there is a, if there is a need or desire to look at enrollment, that you also look at the number of additional housing units. If you choose to do that, not to do that, I understand that as well. I just hope that you're consistent in whatever you do. Thank you. <clears throat> I won't be last. I'll be last. 
Would you like to step down to the podium? My name is Mike Moles, and I live at 423 Ocean House Road. Hadn't planned on saying anything tonight. Uh, I was going to wait till May, but might as well say something tonight. First, let me say to Mr. Almendinger, thank you for coming down tonight. And my daughter Megan babysits and drives. No. So, <laughs> she's also looking for a prom date, so keep that in mind. Um, when I made the commitment, to hold the line on spending, I meant it, and I still mean it. However, who could have anticipated two years ago that the price of oil and gasoline would have increased at the rate it did? Who would have ever guessed that after the voters spoke and said they wanted the state to fund 55% of education and 100% of special education, that everybody in our legislative delegation, Senator Lynn Bromley, Representative Connie Goldman, Representative Jane Eberly, along with the majority of the legislature, would all vote to overrule the citizens' referendum and stick Cape Elizabeth with the bill for increased special education costs. Throughout this budget process, I have been warned by other councillors and the public that the council will have to pay a political price for increasing the school budget. I was elected to do the right thing. If the council needs to pay that price, so be it. As far as my vote goes, I'm not going to punish the students and the staff for the council's decision to go with a rigid cap, blind to what is going on around us. I propose the following budget compromise when we get together again in May, that we hold the school department to the CPIU cap, whatever that CPIU cap is, uh, to keep our commitment, but that we go one step further due to the unforeseen circumstances previously mentioned, we exclude the fuel cost of $171,611 calculated using the manager's projected price of $220 a gallon and the increased special education cost of $102,446 for a total exception of $274,057. Uh, so for the rest of the counselors, that's how I feel on the budget. Thank you all for coming down tonight. <clears throat> Seeing no one else, I'll make last call. Go in once. Going twice, I will declare this public hearing closed. Oh. Um, now wait, you, you don't have to leave. Um, again, um, the, the council is not voting on the budget tonight. If there are counselors that have a comment, but not to talk about how you're going to vote on the budget, Everybody could just hold still for just a minute. I don't know whether there are any comments to be made, um, but the council is welcome to make comments, but I'm not asking for people to state where they stand on the budget one way or another. And if there are none, that's fine. I have a brief comment. I, I just want to say thank you very much to everybody who came tonight and everybody who spoke and everybody else who participated by listening and being part of this. It's a very impressive thing to sit here and listen to so many <clears throat> bright people expound so many great ideas. And I just wanted to publicly acknowledge that and thank you very much. And I share that sentiment expressed by Councillor McKinney. So thank you all for coming. You are welcome to stay for the sewer public hearing. I think that will be very short, but we'll take a short break for people who would like to leave. And thank you.
are going to resume our meeting. <laughs> Councilor Fritz. Councillor Lynch. It's like something I haven't seen. With Paul? Is this a new this one or an old one? one? Oh, oh, oh. Councillor Lynch. <laughs> Councillor Fritz. My apologies. The next item on our agenda is a public hearing on proposed adjustments in the sewer service charges. And seeing no one in the audience <laughs> other than our public works director and our assistant town manager, um, I will invite either of them to speak if they would like to. Otherwise, I will ask our town manager to introduce this item. Yes, uh, thank you, David. Uh, as you all know, we've been looking at the, uh, we've done about a 10-year projection of uh, sewer costs for the town of Cape Elizabeth. And what it showed was if, that if we didn't begin to have small rate adjustments uh, over the next seven or eight years, uh, that we were going to have deficit, significant deficits, cumulative deficits of over a million dollars. Uh, what I'm proposing this evening uh, is a, an increase in the minimum sewer user rate charge of a dollar per month as of July 1 of this year, and a dollar per month, an additional dollar per month as of July 1 of 2007. Uh, secondly, there's the incremental charge for each 100 cubic feet of usage, recommending a 3% increase uh, this year, again on July 1, and a 3% increase next year on July 1. Uh, finally, the sewer connection fee is now $3,300, projecting that increase effective A1 2006 to uh, $3,500. Even, even with this increase, we'll have a projected deficit this coming year of $75,000, but then the next two years we'll have an $81,000 uh, projected surplus. This is with a 3% increase this year, a 3% increase next year. It's proposed the two succeeding years to have no increase, and then a 3% increase on July 1, 2011, and July 1, 2012. We're really looking out. Thank you, uh, David. Thank you. Do um, a motion? Could we have a motion on item number 94, proposed action on sewer service charges following our public hearing? Item number 97. I'm sorry. Oh, thank you. I just wanted to make sure I was... Um, well, it, it's 97. I was yes. okay. looking at a, uh, apparently an outdated agenda, which had it as item number 94. You are correct. Item number 97. Thank you. I would move that the following user charge be effective for the first bill issued after the indicated date for all buildings within the town of Cape Elizabeth connected to the public sanitary sewers of the town, and more specifically, effective July 1, 2006, uh, $32.50 for up to 100 cubic feet of monthly measured water usage, and $4.25 for each additional 100 cubic feet or fraction thereof of monthly measured usage, and that effective July 1, 2007, the um, 100 cubic foot monthly measured usage charge for the first 100 feet be 33.50 and $4.38 for each additional 100 cubic feet beyond that. Um, I would further move that the sewer connection fee be increased to $3,500 for each unit effective May 1, 2006. And I just want to check have I covered all the? That's it. Okay, that's my motion. Second. Right. <laughs> we have a motion and a second. Is there discussion on the motion, Councillor Moles? Just a quick question. What do you do with uh, households that aren't connected to the sewer? They just simply pay the water and there's no additional fees? That's correct. 
Discussion, Councilor Lynch. Um, I, I don't think we have any choice on this, but I just want to um, state for the record, and I guess for the public that might be listening at home, that as I consider the tax increase and the budget going forward, I'm very mindful that a number of people in this town pay sewer bills. The sewer bills are very expensive, um, about twice what people's water bills are. And I think um, we need to keep this in mind as we go forward and deliberate on the budget, because a good, goodly number of people will be um, affected by this. I do have one uh, question for Mike, and that is um, the effective date of, of May 1st for the sewer connection fee. Does that apply to all new buildings um, e even, for instance, uh, Spurwing Woods, even though it's not built but it's approved, does this connection fee, the new connection fee, apply to those new buildings as well? This connection fee applies to anyone who has not applied for their sewer connection fee by that date. We do have a, a pending sewer connection application for the, uh, the building next door, the commercial building. The, that building permit was applied for today. And, came in to see Bob to apply for the sewer connection permit. As long as the application's in by May 1, uh, then, then they'd be all set. Uh, anything after May 1, uh, even if it's already an approved home, if they haven't received their sewer connection permit, they would pay the 3500 Councilor Moles. What's the current sewer connection fee? 3300 Other comments? I, I'd just like to say, I mean, we're in the middle of um, the, some major rehabilitation to the sewage uh, system that people are going to be seeing going on. And I mean, there, uh, we've discussed those um, repairs that needed to be made to the system. And I think it, it's just essential. We have some really serious um, problems, particularly with older systems, and um, I think it is necessary for people who have the services of the sewer system to pay most of the freight, but we have definitely covered um, in our budget, what is it, about a third of the cost of that rehabilitation because there will be some advantage of having roads repaired at the same time. And, and that helps catch up with some of our road repair that's necessary as well. Um, so I'll be favoring this. All those in favor of the motion? The motion is approved, seven in favor, none opposed. That completes our agenda. I have a motion Move to adjourn. To adjourn. Second. Motion, Councilor Lynch. Take a second, Councilor Swift Kayada. All those in favor? We are adjourned.